Hancock and Kelly. Welcome to Hancock and Kelly here on your Sunday morning. Great to have you along. On the right this morning, John Hancock. Good to see you, John. Good morning. Looking good. And on the left is Michael Kelly. Good morning, Michael. Morning, guys. And I'm John Brown. Now we begin today with a recap on the race for president. Roll the tape. Thousands lining up outside Madison Square Garden Saturday morning as polling centers open for early voting in New York. Nationwide, more than 54 million Americans have voted, including President Trump, who cast his ballot Saturday morning in Florida. President, who did you vote for today? Uh, I voted for a guy named Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. With no time to waste before Election Day, the president taking right to the campaign trail, making stops in North Carolina, Ohio, and Wisconsin. Joe Biden's allegiance is to his donors, and my allegiance is to the people of this country. That's it. Democrats also working to get out the vote in several battleground states. Vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris paid a visit to Ohio, while Joe Biden's old boss, former President Barack Obama, campaigned for him in Florida. And for eight years, I saw Joe up close. He was the last one in the room whenever I faced a big decision. He and Kamala are going to be in the fight not for themselves, but for every single one of us. Joe Biden himself held a drive-in rally in Pennsylvania, telling voters he wants to prioritize their safety. I don't like the idea of all this distance, but it's necessary. I appreciate you being safe. What we don't want to do is become super spreaders. Those comments coming just a day after the U.S. set a record for daily new cases of the coronavirus. In Waukesha, Wisconsin, I'm Garrett Tenney, Fox News. All right, John Hancock, we are in the last full week before the election. That also means no more Facebook ads. That's good. So where are we in your estimation? Well, it's going to come down to, luckily, I think it's going to come down to the Eastern time zone on election night. We're going to know pretty early if Donald Trump carries Florida, if he carries Georgia, if he carries North Carolina, uh, and then you head on up to Ohio, then if he captures Pennsylvania, all of them in the Eastern time zone, uh, Donald Trump's going to be reelected president at that point. Uh, he's got to he's got to run that table. Uh, the polls are, are close. He's behind in those states, uh, if, if you believe the polls. But uh, there is a there is a path for a Trump victory. I think it's a narrow path. And we'll know whether he's uh, walking that path pretty early on election night. You know, Michael, every one of those states he's talking about, I looked at the poll numbers this morning, they're all within the margin of error. This could be, a, this could be an interesting next Tuesday. Yeah, anything can happen in 2020. Oh, boy, don't we know that. Right. And all we have to do is remember 2016. The difference here is, is in every one of those polls, while the margins are shrinking, Joe Biden's in the lead. So the president has to do exactly what he did in 2016, which is pull an inside straight. He barely was capable of pulling that off last time against an extremely unpopular candidate. Now he's, now he's fighting with somebody who's far more popular than he is, trailing in all those states. Very optimistic scenario that John Hancock just laid out there. Okay, Michael, let's talk about October surprises. People always talk about these. Some Republicans say Hunter Biden is the October surprise. Uh, doesn't seem to be getting much uh, traction here. If you watched social media at all last night, you saw all the news about uh, the sex tapes and things like that. And I kept saying, well, but that's not illegal. Where is the illegal stuff when it comes to Hunter Biden? Because that hasn't been proven, right? And then you have other stuff with Rudy Giuliani. I, I'm not seeing an October surprise right now, not to mention 57 million people have already voted, so it doesn't matter. John, how can the president having a secret bank account in China and paying more taxes to a communist government than he pays to the United States not be considered an October surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, look, this president's a one-trick pony. He tried to make this all about Hillary Clinton's emails. Now he wants to make it about Hunter Biden's emails. He cannot run on his record. People are fed up, tired, exhausted with the nonsense, and there will be an extreme bash backlash on election night because of it. We want substance. We want change. John, I get, I'm sure you do as well. You guys probably do. I get so many emails all the time about the Hunter Biden stuff, and I keep saying, until something is proven, not to mention he's not on the ballot, I get it that his dad is, was dad covering, but nothing has been proven at this point, so I don't, I don't know where to go with this one. Well, if we know anything at all about this Hunter Biden fiasco, is that Hunter Biden should never have taken that directorship uh, with Burisma. 
And, you know, it, 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 at, at best, it looks bad. Right. And at worst, <clears throat> there was they were up to no good. And, you know, this is a highly embarrassing, if nothing else, situation. I mean, you know, you got Hunter Biden doing what he's doing. Poor Rudy's tucking his shirt in. I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff going on out there. Yeah, if you haven't seen the uh, the Borat thing yet, that oh. Michael, you've seen it twice. I, my daughter made me watch it, and I'm like, this is beyond cringeworthy. I don't even know what was going on there, but I don't care who you are. That's weird. It was extremely weird, sick, messed up. You know, thinking about Rudy Giuliani, has there ever been someone who has squandered a legacy? Uh, like Rudy Giuliani did. He was America's mayor, somebody everybody liked, and here he is in this hotel room. I don't care what his excuse is, it ain't good. Well, I, we're different body types, but I've never had to lay on my bed to tuck in my shirt. That, that's all I'm saying, that's just me. I tuck in my shirt, I, anyway. Well, you but, know, the kids don't even tuck their shirts in anymore, Brown. You don't point. have to worry about that. Good point. Let's go back to the debate. Now, where are you going to get this kind of analysis anywhere else, right? Let's go back to the debate here. Was there anything, John Hancock, that may have been enough to sway people? The only thing I can think of was the, the oil stuff by Joe Biden. What do you got? Well, yeah, I mean, transitioning away from, from fossil fuels and oil specifically, and that came right at the end of the debate. Uh, you're looking at a state like Texas that Democrats had some, you know, phony idea they were going to carry. Well, that's gone. Uh, and, and the whole oil industry, when you look at Pennsylvania and Ohio, both huge fracking states, um, that could have had an effect. You know, I kind of wish Donald Trump would have performed as he did this week uh, the same way in the first debate. Because I think that first debate performance, you know, if you, if you look, follow the polls, Donald Trump took a hit after that first debate. I think if he would have performed there as he did here, uh, he probably wouldn't have taken that hit. Uh, but as it is, it was. I think. I think Trump won that debate. Whether it's gonna, I don't think it's gonna change many minds. But the oil thing does have some potential to move some votes in some key states. Michael, anything for you? Yeah. If the bar was that the president acted like a rational, normal human being, he did that on his last debate, and we're supposed to say be excited about that. Look, uh, this this election, you know, in the past, it's always been about the economy. Stupid. It's about COVID. It's affecting every human being on the planet, everybody in the United States, 200 and a quarter, 225,000 of us have died from this. We're dealing with this virus going on. The president says it's gonna go away. It's, go it's going away so well that all of his people continue to keep getting infected, including now the vice president's staff. All right, still to come here on Hancock and Kelly, we know that many people don't it's like the behavior of President mouth. Trump, Not really. but they Not also aren't happy Sorry, with the that. leftward lunge of Democrats. Well brush, get tips and I don't know what that sound you're hearing is right now, but we're also going to talk about what people are going to do with their ballots coming up. Is there anything that can move people along so to popular. change their ballots so at this point? That's coming up.
To hear more, listen to the podcast. Just search for Hancock and Kelly. You know what I think that sound was, John Hancock? CB, CB radios. Somebody going oh. by the studio. We're, we're old school here, yeah. CB radios picking it up from back in the day, 20 years ago. Here's more, good buddy. Yeah, right. <laughs> I bet you used to do that, right? I'd love to hear your old uh, trucker name. All right, I want to talk about this group of undecided voters that was in the news this week. These people say they could be moved. They're primarily suburban men and women, moderates and independents who aren't all that thrilled with the behavior and the rhetoric of President Trump, but say they're doing pretty well economically. They also claim they like Joe Biden personally, but they're worried about how far left the Democratic Party is going. So, Michael, I'll start with you on this one. I found that interesting because I assume there are a lot of people in that boat, even if they're not really undecided, or if they've already voted, not a whole lot that can be done now because they may have voted already, but I, what can be done to make sure we don't get in the same position down the road where we get two candidates where we're like, hmm, not so sure about this? Well, this happens every election, right. right? I mean, every election we have this conversation, oh, I just wish our choices were somebody else. Well, it's a binary choice. Why is it get this way? We just gonna spend a billion dollars on each side tarnishing each other uh, that's just what's going to happen. I don't buy for a second, as we sit here a little under 10 days away from Election Day, that anybody's undecided. I think if you're still saying you're undecided now, you're just looking for attention and likely aren't going to vote. <laughs> you you want to get on one of those NBC panels of the undecideds and get your free your pizza and snacks, I guess. John, what about your thoughts well, you on know, this? I, I do know people uh, that are genuinely uh, struggling with this choice. And... Um, you know, I, I don't think it's a lot of people, but I do think there are undecided voters out there. All right, John, I want to go to you on this one, too. President Trump had a big success on foreign policy this week. Once again, Israel, the Middle East. And it was brought to my attention by someone who follows debates that in neither of the debates this week was the topic of foreign affairs or terrorism even a topic. OK, that was the topic of every debate four and eight years ago. In fact, foreign policy, ISIS and Homeland Security were two of the most talked about issues in the debates between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. So what should we take away from the lack of discussion about it this time around? You know, I think it's unfortunate because the president actually has had some real success, particularly in the Middle East of late uh, in, in foreign affairs. And, and look, ISIS has wiped off the map. Well, when this president took office, ISIS had a footprint in the Middle East that spanned over three nations, uh, territories, and uh, and that is gone. Uh, their top people have been eliminated from the from the battlefield. They're, they're dead. Um, and, you know, foreign affairs is an important function, and that's the one area that the president really gets to act alone and uh, or largely alone. And um, for it not to be part of any of these debates, I think, is unfortunate and probably not helpful for the president. You know, Michael, in having this discussion last night with some, some policy people, I said, to me, it stands out that the biggest issue we face right now may not even be a discussion four years from now. We handle issues and move on. What do you take away? Well, I pray that's the case because the biggest issue we're dealing with right now is literally a virus that you can get from breathing. Mm. The most fundamental thing we do as human beings, we all have to breathe. You can get sick from it. Guys, really, the economy, taxes, foreign policy, Everything has been pushed to the back burner for a word we didn't even know when this year started. The president has botched dealing with COVID. There is going to be no other issue that is going to grasp and grab the attention of the American people outside of that. It is in every aspect of our lives. If we're still doing this show in four years, fella, which, uh, boy, somebody ought to gamble on that one. Uh, I, what are the odds we're talking about COVID in four years? They're like zero, right? There's got to be zero chance. No, no, listen, you guys made fun of me before because I was afraid of the virus. You remember that. It was one of our last shows. Look, I don't think this is the last pandemic we're going to face in our lifetime. And I know that's a bold statement, but this has been something that the foreign policy people have been worried about for decades. With how intertwined we are and how mobile we are now as an entire planet, I think this COVID is just the beginning of dominoes that we're going to be dealing with going forward. All right, now let's go to that congressional race here in St. Louis. Got a lot of national attention when Cori Bush defeated Lacey Clay in the primary. It's back in the news due to a tweet. Cori Bush tweeted this past week that if you think you're having a bad day, just think of all the social services we're going to fund after we defund the Pentagon. 
Republicans thought it was irresponsible. Even Democrats had to distance themselves from the Democratic uh, candidate here. Uh, State Senator Jill Shoup, who was in the running for Congress in Missouri's 2nd Congressional District, tweeted that she doesn't believe we should do that. Nicole Galloway said, not a good idea. John Hancock, your thoughts on her tweet? Well, you know, the Democratic Party is, you know, they've got to deal with this thing. And, um, you know, it's, it's, she's putting all of her fellow Democrats in a really tough spot. They have to distance themselves. I mean, this is a ridiculous comment. Uh, it's irresponsible. It's not something that a member of Congress should be talking about. And uh, and it puts the Democrats in a difficult spot. And the gentleman well, you keep seeing, by the way, is the one running against uh, Cory Bush right now, by the way. That's him. Michael? Well, there's no doubt about it that it uh, was a ridiculous statement. Let's think about this. The two largest employers soon to be in the first congressional district are Boeing. Who do they make planes for? The United States Pentagon. And then we have NGA, our huge victory that was brought to us by Lacey Clay that's going to be there. We defund the Pentagon. Come on. I don't think that's what Cori Bush meant. But this is the problem that Democrats have. Uh, people can appreciate that we need to reallocate resources. But when you put out a blanket statement that is so bold like that, it's going to be an issue, and it should be. Now, I do find it interesting that John wants to mock the conversation that's coming from the left when we literally have congressional people running on an idea that there are people drinking the blood of babies and kids, and that's not ridiculous. Cori Bush was wrong. Our discourse is wrong. Let's hope we get some rational thought in this uh, Congress soon. All right. Still to come here on Hancock and Kelly, we have more viewer questions. One is about how we pick our candidates. As we just talked about a bit ago, 320 million Americans. And like we said, people not happy about the final choices. So is there another way? All right, here's something interesting on the COVID front lines this morning. Missouri and Illinois, really much of the country right now, either hitting record high numbers or close to it when it comes to COVID-19. 
We were told this week that our St. Louis area hospitals getting close to capacity, but many of the people in the hospitals right now are coming from the rural areas outside of the St. Louis area where mask usage is often lower. And here's something else that will validate all the mask wearers out there. New studies show that states where people are less likely to wear masks have the highest numbers right now. So Michael, uh, your thoughts on this one? It seems like, you know, one doctor told me this week that you may not be able to get your back surgery soon because elective procedures are going to be scaled back because some overweight guy in the boot heel doesn't want the government to infringe on his rights and he's going to end up in the hospital. Well, there's so many things that are colliding here. This is one a failure of our health care system across this country where rural hospitals have fled. It's a failure of this administration, both at the federal and state level, that we are dealing with this. Uh, we are led by both Republicans who are not making masks mandatory. And as a result, people are getting sick. The only hospitals they can go to are in the big cities. This is a crisis, and it's going to get worse between now and the end of the year and all the way through the end of flu season. You know, John, it does show how decisions in one part of the state or the country impact everybody else, too. Well, mask mandates don't result in appreciably higher rates of people wearing masks. Uh, people wear masks because they believe that it keeps them and others safe. There are some people out there that aren't doing that. I wear a mask whenever I go out. But a mandate is not going to appreciably increase the compliance with wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. And it's these, uh, these folks that, that are not masking up are the ones that are getting sick. All right, let's go to a viewer question we got this week. This one on, it comes on Friday. Randy in Chesterfield writes. And this, by the way, he's responding to a tweet from John Hancock. It reads, John Hancock was spot on. The fact that all the cable news networks have become echo chambers is a sad state of affairs. It's no wonder we can't get along when we surround ourselves only with people who agree with us on everything. So here's what John Hancock tweeted out right after the debate. He tweeted, post-debate, 10 p.m. hour, neither CNN, Fox, nor MSNBC has a panel with anyone with contrary viewpoints about the debate. This is not conducive to a national discussion. John Hancock, you want to elaborate on that? Well, I want to, I want to say hi to my cousin Randy. And yeah, Chester right. uh, great, great comment, Randy. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're feeding people. The people are going to get fed what they want to hear, and that's not helpful. It's not conducive to a conversation. There needs to be more, you know, as much as you may not like it, there needs to be more Michael Kelly's in the world, and uh, and we need to have these conversations because that's it's more healthy for all. Michael Kelly, very quickly. Well, I mean, it's John's exactly right. He's spot on. Look, you, you've got to be able to listen and have constructive dialogue. We're all viewing the world through our own prism these days, and it's not healthy. So. When you're upset with those cable news channels, turn on Hancock and Kelly. We'll always give you both sides. All right, still to come here on Hancock and Kelly. It is time for final thoughts. How about that? The best part of the show. We're going to leave you today with uh, how about some fall colors, I believe. There we have them. Fall colors over the trees surrounding Creevecore Lake in Maryland Heights.
857 on your Sunday morning time for final thoughts. John Hancock, you are up first. 24 years ago today, Brown. Yes. This young fellow, put the picture up there. Oh, boy. This young fellow was closing out his campaign for Secretary of State, and that's Michael Kelly's high school civics teacher up there in the upper right hand corner. You recognize 24 Mr. Kelly? years Michael? ago. <laughs> wow, you had hair. Oh, yeah. What was your main form of employment back in the 70s, John? <laughs> I bought a vacuum cleaner from you. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, you're up very quickly, yeah, almost out of time. time. So it's this simple, folks. Less than 10 days. Vote, 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 vote. 50 million of us have voted. They're expecting 160 to 170 million of us. Why wait till election day? Go out and cast your vote for whoever it is that you choose. There's no excuse to not participate. All right, one more picture. Throw it up real quick, fellas. This show now Emmy nominated. Hancock and Kelly <laughs> Emmy nominated show. I think we have the picture. Do we not have the picture? No. I'm now an Emmy nominated traffic cop is what my agent says. Congratulations to you two fellas. Congratulations, guys. All right, so that goes on the resume forever, no matter what happens. Thanks for watching Hancock and Kelly. If you missed any part of the show, download it on your smartphone. Search out Hancock and Kelly. Chris Wallace is up next. We'll see you back here next Sunday.